So there's a couple of storylines, I think, that need to be celebrated, discussed today. One of them is what you were just talking about, which was pass protection. Brandon Coleman, take a bow. You have a day. You got your left tackle, ladies and gentlemen. Let Adam Peters cook. In the same draft as you get Jaden Daniels at number two, in the third round, they take Coleman, who a lot of teams thought was a guard. Do you remember when Washington thought differently about players than everybody else did? What that used to mean? What that normally led to? The commanders looked at Brandon Coleman, who a lot of people said, oh, there's a guard. And they said, no, he's a tackle. And it looks like they've got their future long-term answer at left tackle based on injury and only injury. Cornelius Lucas has been very good. He has been splitting reps with Brandon Coleman. This weird situation that normally doesn't make sense. This is not baseball. You don't platoon at first base at left tackle. That's not really what you do. But Coleman had to go one-on-one throughout much of the game with Brian Burns. Had to take on one of the better pass rushers in the National Football League who'd had a sack in four straight games in five of six. And 27 dropbacks, zero pressures allowed. Top pass blocking grade on the team. Played on all 62 snaps, many against an elite edge. And he shut him out. What a performance for Brandon Coleman on the road. Not like you're at home and you're getting off on the snap. I'm not saying it was the the hardest environment to ever play in at the Meadowlands, but you'd rather be at home than on the road. Ain't easy, yeah. That was really impressive. Two quarterback hits allowed, according to the pro football reference, for the game. PFF had him at zero pressures. Yeah. No quarterback hits. Not the game. They had him 27 pass blocking snaps, zero pressures. I'm sorry. I was mean, and the Giants is a team, is what I was referencing. Yeah. So the point is that's the best pass rushing team in the NFL coming into this week. You probably cost them the number one ranking because of that. That performance is outstanding. Again, that's that's a execution by the offensive line. That's just good blocking. That's good Jaden Daniels. That's great Cliff Kingsbury. Everything under the sun. Yeah, with, they all without Brian Robinson. Without without that thumper, that gut punch through the middle, time after time after time to soften some of that stuff. Usually that's the best formula. You find a pass rush, you go, fine. Deal with the run game. Deal with pulling guards. Deal with tight ends. Deal with getting chipped. Run your butt off. Bring my tank of a running back to the ground a bunch of times. Then we'll see how well you pass rush later on. They didn't have access to that. Still didn't matter. That Kingsbury stat, to me, he deserves credit. They all do. But ball's coming out. When we want to drop our guy back five and seven steps, I'm going to make sure that I keep extra guys in to hold up and pass pro to help him. So you scheme that up. That's a Jaden Daniels stat as well. Look around at other young quarterbacks and what they're doing. Look at how Caleb Williams operates. He was pressured on a ridiculous amount of snaps, and some of that is the line in front of him, obviously. But he does his little Kyler Murray running circles in the pocket thing, and I'm going to escape this way and escape that way, and I'm going to hold on to the ball. Not Jaden Daniels. Ball's in my hand. I'm planting. I'm anchoring. I'm processing. I'm firing. Ball's out. But we also just got to give credit to this offensive front. Because they got beat up all offseason. Everyone wanted to talk about how bad they were. And they were new. My point all along was, well, how do we know that they're bad? They have signed a new starting center, $10 million a year, who's awesome. They have signed a new starting left guard in Allegretti, who's been really, really good. They're going to have a new starting left tackle. Brandon Coleman, excellent yesterday. Wiley was probably the most hated on player on the team undeservedly, I thought. In the second half of last year, he's elevated his game. And Cosme's the truth. But this line, the the way, as you said, the tight ends are protecting as well, they have been marvelous, Danny. Marvelous. No no other way to describe that. Again, my – how do I want to say this the right way? Like, I I don't think I I was critical of the front office. I was in certain areas, and I was wrong about that. I've said that a million times. I'll continue to say it. I was dead wrong on a number of fronts. But the the question I had or the, the way that I felt about it, I would go, I don't know that I have the Huevos Rancheros to have a rookie quarterback where where everything hinges on his success to go into the season with Andrew Wiley at one tackle and journeyman Jerry swing tackle and a third rounder that ever that half the league thought was a guard as my protective options. I just wouldn't be able to do that. I would have gone overboard to make sure that he was well protected. Even if I had to swallow some salary and have Andrew Wiley be the, one of the most expensive backups in the sport. I would have made sure I was as good as I could possibly be at the tackle spots just for my own edification so I could sleep at night. 
They saw it. They assessed it correctly. They nailed all the pieces involved. This unit is outstanding. They are all on the same page, whether that's a Tyler Biotish as the catalyst situation, whether that's offensive line coaching. Remember, uh, the former giant offensive line coach was the only question mark kind of on that coaching staff. Take a bow. After that, after, after this week, everything is humming on that side. Really, really impressive, man. Like, not missing Brian Robinson in a game going up against one of the league's worst rush defenses. You somehow don't miss him. That's incredible to me. Like, it's it's now become routine. I can't let it yet. I can't let it become just the normal thing that they do. Nothing about this is normal here. The other thing I wanted to call attention to out of the shoot today, and this is mostly about Jaden Daniels, but I will say this about everybody. They do not turn the football over at a historical rate at this point. Yep. I'm sure everybody's seen this from Elias Sports Bureau now. This stat was everywhere last night. But the Commanders have turned the ball over three times in their first nine games. The fewest by a team through nine games to start a season since 1933 when they began tracking the stat. They do not turn the ball over. Since an era where it was a penalty when you didn't complete a forward pass. Like, it's a different time. That would be a staggering statistic if you were a veteran quarterback-led championship caliber program that would be nuts right with a rookie quarterback rookies make mistakes rookies get fooled yeah rookies throw the ball up for grabs sometimes right you see it all over the league all the time with young qbs Jaden daniels almost never puts the ball in harm's way he had four interceptions last year at lsu i think total in a 50 touchdown season but again some of this i got to give credit to cliff kingsbury because He is the highest expected completion percentage in the league. You're scheming uh, guys open. You're making a lot of throws easy for him. Some of this can be pass pro because there's not as many rushed uh, throws, throws where he's hit as he's delivering, whatever. But this piece of the puzzle that's the biggest is just Jaden's. They don't turn the ball over. He doesn't make young person stupid mistakes. He never, ever does. And some of it's a little bit of luck, frankly, with fumbles because they've fumbled a bunch this year as a team and haven't really lost those fumbles. Mm-hmm. I think about like the fumble on the kickoff, if you remember, against the Bears at home last week, where Jeremy McNichols comes flying in and recovers it, or a couple of the Earths fumbles where Allegretti or someone comes sliding in and and they don't lose those balls. Some of that's a little bit of good fortune, but for the most part, Danny, they just never turn the ball over. Yeah. To the point where they have now, we're over halfway through the season, nine games in, have turned the ball over less than any team in history. And that's staggering. It's staggering. And, and that's probably the number one reason you would say that this group has been successful i think so right i mean obviously the people jane daniels you know uh, a general manager coaching staff etc but on field product not turning it over ever is a huge plus for your for your squadron that's usually a great corollary right or correlation where you turn it over a bunch of times you lose that battle somebody gets something easy you end up you know coming up empty and it's usually can be a devastating play and you're right some of it's good fortune but beyond that the like the thing that hasn't happened that i'm just warning everybody is going to that pass that goes in and out of a receiver's hands that's intercepted, the tip pass to the line of scrimmage that falls harmlessly to the side, it goes into a linebacker's hands. Bad luck is going to happen. It's the sport, right? It, it, it's by its nature. Maybe not. But also, <laughs> then again, maybe it doesn't. I mean, it's been nine games. I was texting with the guys yesterday, and I, I, Toby and, and a couple of the, the dudes, and I was like, when did we become the team in this town, as you said at the start of the show, where it seems like all the breaks go Washington's way. It's happening. Mm -hmm. How did the Giants miss that tackle on De'Ami Brown at the end of the half? That is 98 times out of 100. That It was the right play by Daniels. Absolutely. Get the ball out of your hand. Don't get sacked. Give up. Basically, live to fight the next snap. You're getting into field goal range by checking it down. And then the Giants just miss a tackle, and he turns it into 25 yards, and they get a first and 10 with 12 seconds to go. And then the next play, a dime by Daniels. He's like, like, oh, I guess I'll just throw a dime for a tutty here. I I wasn't going to, but I will now. For 20 years, assuming they didn't snap it over someone's head or there wasn't (laughs) a sack or a fumble or something, you throw that ball and just normal football happens, and the Giants make a tackle, and now you have a long field goal that you probably miss or something. Mm -hmm. Except this year, they don't make the tackle. Yami Brown, who's probably your least likely receiver to run through that tackle, does. <laughs> and then you have the next play where the Giants just go man on the edge with Terry McLaurin and a DB that can't cover him. And Daniels makes the perfect throw. 
But there was a million little circumstances like that. How smart was the Bobby Wagner play where he went and picked up the football after the whistle? I'll, I'll never understand why people don't do that. I, I have never gotten why. And to me, that's a coaching point and a, or a Hall of Fame caliber player in Bobby Wagner points. That's why you signed Bobby Wagner. But He's I've, smarter than everybody else. I've never understood why people just sort of will drop the ball or not, you know, touch the receiver when he's down or whatever, just overkill. Nobody's saying you got to spear the dude when he's, you know, when he's on the ground, but just everyone make sure every time always. And that's just the correct thing to do. That play, right. Which was a clear sack and Dante Fowler has been incredible. Yeah. Clear sack and fumble two sacks yesterday for Fowler. He's got six sacks in his last five games. Now at this point, he had a half sack in the first four games of the season. And now he's got six over his last five. He's been an animal. He's just a beast. As good a player as they've had on defense. I also thought Jeremy Chin was he had a day. terrific. He was yesterday. flying around. A couple of the Adam Peters additions, short contract veterans coming in here with something to prove, right? But sack fumble, obviously. When you, you took one second watching the replay, you go, yep, fumble, clearly. But they were blowing the whistle, and no one had picked up the football. Dead ball at that point, I would think. How many times would they have been screwed on that play over the years mm-hmm. where it was obviously a fumble and eventually Wagner picked it up and started running with it, but go back and watch. They're blowing the play dead. No one's picked it up. In fact, the, the running back was really good. Tyrone Tracy was closer to the ball than Bobby Wagner. And then the ref blows it dead. And Tracy just kind of goes, Oh, well, never mind." And Wagner keeps running and picks it up. Love that he did that. But that felt to me like if I was the giants, I'd have been pretty salty. Like, Hey man, you, you, Ruled the play dead. It's over now. I've seen that before where a team will try to challenge and they're like, oh, yeah, the whistle's blown. The whistle. We were wrong and we're more wrong. Watch this. Yeah. But just those little things mm-hmm. are adding up and enough of them. And then, oh, by the way, you're just better and you bully someone and you're more physical. Washington has the better GM than the Giants. They've got the better head coach than the Giants. They've got the better quarterback than the Giants. They've got the better skill position groups than the Giants. I would venture to say they have a comparable defense to the Giants. I like the Giants pass rush when they're fully healthy more, but didn't look like the Giants defense was any better yesterday or in in the last few weeks than Washington's has been. They've allowed seven or fewer points in the first half and four of the last five games. Think about that. Yeah. Two straight shutouts in the first half going into yesterday and then seven points allowed in the first half. And that was with, again, the Giants having some success. I mean, think about the bully ball they play talking about bully ball. They, they, there, it wasn't a lot of fancy runs. What a lot of, and there was a couple of misdirections in there just to keep you on your toes, but it was, you know, a gap, a gap, you know, sometimes on the back of a guard, a couple of counters here and there, they're playing smash mouth, pushed you around in the, in the first half. Thank goodness for that one drop back to pass or, or a screen where you get that fumble that you, that you referenced. There's your first stop. And, you know, the Giants end up scoring a touchdown, but adjustments get made. So then, you know, there's, there's something else the Giants were able to do in the second half, but I like that. I like it's not, if, if something's working, it's not automatically going to work the rest of the way. Against them. Well, that's not what I like. only that, because that's a good point. Be my guest. Run the ball on me. Mm-hmm. Never throw it to Malik Neighbors for a half. Yeah. Please. Please, God Almighty, do that every time. Because here's why. You're not very good. So if you need to run the ball 12 times on a drive and you're getting five, seven, nine, four, two, six, eight, you know, in these chunks, go for it, buddy. You're not throwing the ball downfield once. Mm-hmm. You're not trying out my DBs one time. You're going to have one passing yard in the first half and clap like a seal because you you established the run, though, and you, you won in the trenches, though. How many points did you score? Seven? That's what I'm about, yeah. You're you're down by 10? You're down 17 to 7 at the half, and you're supposed to be feeling good walking to the locker room because you ran the ball, though? Be my guest. That, that only works for you if you can make some plays in the passing game like Washington did. Yeah, I'm all about that. that that's kind of our we, – we've been discussing this all year about their run defense. It's not good. I mean, they're, they're, to me, there are, this defense is now at a point where there there's, it's like a, it's like a the way to explain it is it's almost a two fold situation. It's like an, if then, if you're playing a bad offense, that's bad. Washington can dominate. We've seen it done Cleveland, uh, that Arizona game, Arizona's offense plan was terrible. Uh, we've seen it in, uh, you know, uh, a couple of their other wins, right? If, it, if an offense has something good, you can take one thing away at a time. See Baltimore. They took away Derrick Henry in the first half. Oh, they did a great job. Say Flowers, nine for a million. So this this first half will take away some of your passing game. They ran it at will. Then they switched the second half, and it was the opposite they gave up. But that's where they are. They're not great, but they're not terrible either. Yeah, they have gone from bad to fine. Mm-hmm. They have gone from bottom five in the league to probably middle of the pack. I don't need you to be a lot better than middle of the that's pack. Right. 
if you generate a couple more takeaways, which they still don't do consistently enough, but if they were able to get a takeaway or two in every single game playing defense the way they are with this offense, they're going to win a ton because this is an elite offense. And by the way, we never talk about this. They are excellent on special teams. Yes, they are. Their punt returns with Zacchaeus, their kick returns with Eckler, their coverage, their kicker, Seibert, who only kicks from like 37 and in for some reason. Uh, it seems like they, they rarely ever kick long field goals. Tress way bombed one almost 60 yards yesterday. They are really good on teams. They're just a really good team. Just good. They're seven and two, and they're awesome. And I can't wait for Sunday. I cannot wait for the Steelers to come here with a championship level defense so we can see what what that, that looks like. 